Just give me the thumbs up. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance records so that you get the uh, continuing education credits that you deserve. Uh, that's in the back of the auditorium. Also, please remember to fill out and leave the uh, program evaluation. Uh, and if you could give us any ideas in regards to future topics and future speakers, we would appreciate that. Uh, today, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Rick Carano. Dr. Carano is board certified in internal medicine and also is uh, board certified in endocrinology and metabolism. Uh, he is uh, in the Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism at uh, McFarland and also here at Mary Greeley Medical Center. And he's here today to update us on type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carano. Thank you, Steve. Everybody hear me all right? Okay. Well, it's nice to be back. It's been a while since I've been up here, and I've got more gadgets than I can figure out to deal with here. Um, they asked me to present about type 2 diabetes mellitus, and huge topic. So I had to kind of try to streamline it with, try for what I thought would be the best uh, information for mainly primary care providers, which I believe these uh, meetings are kind of geared for. So a lot of information. I've tried to, to kind of put it into a, a concise approach. I will first give you a little uh, background synopsis of type 2 diabetes mellitus, and we'll go into the major part of the talk, which would be the management options for type 2 diabetes mellitus. When I first started this endocrinology job a few years ago, I won't say how long, it was pretty simple. We had insulin and sulfonylureas, and you could try different types of insulin regimens, and you could try combinations. It was called BIDS-type program, basal insulin, daytime sulfonylurea. You don't hear that term anymore, probably, but those were the, th those were the days. I mean, that's what we had, and it was tough because we ran out of options for patients very quickly, and we basically had a lot of people on insulin and not very well controlled. Things have changed a huge change over the past 10 to 15 years. And as I went through the talk and prepared it and went through all the different classes of medications that are available for, for treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus, it was like, wow, how am I going to get this in in 45 minutes? So it is very streamlined. It, it, I do leave time, at the, I'll try to leave time at the end for questions. And I'm sure, I hope you have questions because I do. And how do we use all these medications? Where do they fit in? Uh, Who's best treated with them? I don't have all the answers, but I have my own approach, and I'll try to give you that. And, you know, at the, at the end, you'll see that my last slide, I'll give you a little foreshadowing of it, is, you know, it's dealer's choice. That nowadays, there's so many options, so many good options, that we have to consider them when we're dealing with our type 2 diabetics that in these days have huge problems with insulin resistance, with, um, with, uh, poor control, and, you know, uh, obesity, et cetera. So I, I don't have time to go through everything. This is probably, I saw that they had to, to be determined in mid-July. I don't want to do the talk then, but we could probably do three or four presentations on type 2 diabetes mellitus if you really wanted to learn about it all. So in this 45-minute presentation, I hope you learned something, and I, I really hope you have some questions at the end. As this says, one of the approaches doesn't work that well, but it's been around a long time. I've got a good idea, no more food. Well, we know that doesn't work. So, huge problem. These are the estimates from a few years ago. 8% of the U.S. adult population and 6.4% worldwide prevalence in adults. So you can, do, you can crunch the numbers, but probably close to 25 million Americans have type 2 diabetes mellitus. And um, many are undiagnosed or untreated. But the majority, I think, nowadays are at least diagnosed and hopefully the vast majority are treated. But we still know we have a huge number of patients that are not getting the care that they really should have. And as you know, and again, I'm not getting into the, all the complications, but as you know, untreated hyperglycemia is a huge cause of cardiovascular and microvascular disease, renal failure, retinal disease, one of the leading causes of blindness still in, uh, in people under the age of 70. So it's a, it's a huge problem. So we really need to be aggressive with the diagnosis and the management of, of type 2 diabetes mellitus. 
Uh, these are the diagnostic numbers that, you, that we have for the past several years recommended by the ADA. Fasting blood glucose greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. A hemoglobin A1C, which is now and it has, been, has been used as a diagnostic tool for the past few years of 6.5% or greater. And you can use that as a diagnostic tool. Two-hour post-plasma glucose of greater than 200 on an oral glucose tolerance test. And a random plasma glucose with symptoms of greater than 200. So that's pretty simple. You know, we don't have to do three-hour glucose tolerance testing. We usually don't have to do the two-hour test. We usually can get the diagnosis with fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C values. Uh, you want to kind of choose your patients that you monitor closely and you try to diagnose early and hopefully intervene early with, intervent with, uh, me with lifestyle and, and uh, medication intervention. The risk factors are listed here. They're pretty self-explanatory. I don't think surprising. Anybody over age 45. Uh, anybody with a, bo a body mass index of greater than or equal to 25, especially increases more as your weight increases as a continuum. You know, you get up to BMI of 30, 35, 40. It's greater e at each one of those levels. If you have a primary relative that has type 2 diabetes mellitus. If you have a female patient that in her, when she was in childbearing age and had, she had gestational diabetes mellitus or wasn't diagnosed and tells you, yeah, I had a baby that weighed 10 pounds, so uh, having delivered an infant greater than nine pounds, those are risk factors. Those are patients that should be monitored closely for type 2 diabetes mellitus. Just having hypertension, dyslipidemia, especially if they have low HDL cholesterol, elevated triglycerides. Those are kind of hallmarks of insulin resistance and, and development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. You go ahead and see between 5.7 and 6.5 is prediabetes mellitus and also a hallmark of someone that's at risk for type 2 diabetes mellitus. That old term, Polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is really an insulin resistance syndrome. Uh, individual women with uh, obesity, usually with obesity, hirsutism, um, and other home, sometimes if they did ultrasound had done polycystic ovarian o ovaries, these are patients at risk. Infertility, oligomenorrhea are, are kind of uh, hallmarks of that syndrome. And if they've had a history of vascular disease, early coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, or um, they're at risk also. So a lot of obvious things that you can use clinically to, to choose your patients that you're going to be watching for the disease closely. And as primary providers, that's, that's I think, important for you to do. Because this is an ongoing disease. This is not something that just happens. This is a disease that starts very young for a lot of people, goes through a continuum, and then eventually in their lifetime, varies at the age. The age can vary, very dependent on uh, what you know, what their lifestyle has been like, and what their genetics are. But it is from insulin resistance, and then what we call a relative insulin deficiency or beta cell dysfunction. So you know, you can have people that are 400 pounds and not be type 2 diabetics. Besides the obesity, they have to have these hallmarks of insulin resistance, and then. Relative, beta, uh, relative insulin deficiency from a beta cell dysfunction. And what they kind of, just in a kind of a quick r reason for that developing is there's this evidence in these individuals that are at risk for type 2 diabetes that they have impaired processing of pro-insulin to insulin in the islet cells and insufficient time for granules to mature so more pro-insulin release not as effective and they end up with the uh, development of beta cell dysfunction and hyperglycemia. There's genetic risks and environmental risks. Of course, if we eat and overeat and become morbidly obese, we're going to have more risk of developing type 2 diabetes at a younger age. Dr. Bergenstahl uh, developed this slide years ago, and it's still a great slide for using in, in any presentation on type 2 diabetes mellitus because it gives you the timeline of what happens to these individuals that have um, type 2 diabetes they, at a you know, probably good 10 or more years prior to the diagnosis, they'll start to develop this insulin resistance. And that's in the blue line here. Hmm. I'm not go there. So on the blue line, you'll have the insulin resistance. And to keep your blood sugars normal, the individual will produce more insulin. So they actually are hyperinsulinemic. The high insulin levels keep the blood sugars at a relatively normal level. 
beta cells have that dysfunction, so over the years they're losing their ability to produce enough insulin, so your insulin levels are starting to drop. Uh, I mean, the beta cell function is starting to drop, and the insulin levels start to drop along with that beta cell dysfunction. The insulin resistance, though, persists throughout the lifetime of the individual. And with the insulin resistance, the diminished insulin production over years, then the blood sugars start to elevate. And the first ones we see usually go up are postprandial, followed by the fasting blood sugars. So right in here is where patients should be diagnosed. Unfortunately, a lot of them are diagnosed way out here because they don't seek medical advice. So they may have a good 10 years plus of undiagnosed, untreated type 2 diabetes mellitus. That's why when you diagnose a patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus, you need to assume that they've had the disease for quite a while. They, they need to have other evaluations, ex including, a, including a dilated eye exam, because you may have someone already with retinal disease because of the prolonged hyperglycemia that's been gone undiagnosed and untreated. There are other things that can contribute to hyperglycemia and even cause type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, steroid-induced uh, diabetes mellitus, several antipsychotic medications, and I'm sure that our mental health providers that presented here are very well aware of the, the, the effects of many of their antipsychotics have on blood glucose values and elevations, vasopressors in the ICU. Thiazide diuretics contribute to elevated blood glucoses in some part related to the dropping of the potassium, which contributes to elevated blood glucose. Our infectious disease colleagues with their HIV antiretroviral medications can contribute to elevated blood glucose and development of diabetes mellitus, of course. Many immunosuppressants for the patients that have had transplants are at risk. Um, used to be a big problem with, when women were on oral contraceptives because it were kind of high dose uh, estrogens in, the, in, those treat, in those pills, but with the lower combination, do, combination lower contraceptives, it's not as much of a problem, but they still can somewhat contribute to elevated blood glucoses. So look at your drug list when you have the person that comes in with new type 2 diabetes mellitus, because you may find some clues there. So now we get into the management aspect of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus. At diagnosis, still the mainstay of treatment is lifestyle. They need, they should, and it is, in, I think, imperative that they meet with the diabetic team, the diabetic education team, the dietitian, the diabetic educator, and they're instructed on proper lifestyle adjustments. That's another whole talk in itself. Maybe have them come back. And then they need to start monitoring their blood glucoses. That's standard of care, they, and, and that's sometimes hard for patients to accept, but it is important because it gives us some you know, feedback to how they're doing with their diabetes day to day, and it gives them feedback, and it makes them, I think, aware that this is a disease that needs to be taken care of because most of the time we'll do, uh, in the patients that are diagnosed as reasonably early in their disease, you can do lifestyle modification and metformin. That's another thing I don't think that's maybe known, but the standard of care now is when you've diagnosed someone with type 2 diabetes mellitus, unless there's a contraindication in metformin, that should be started. For several years, until about five years ago, maybe five to eight years ago, we treated people with lifestyle modification and delayed medications saying, well, let's try three months of lifestyle modification. Oh, let's try another three months. Let's try another three months. And the data that was collected over the years showed that we delayed intervention with, or with uh, pharmacology for type 2 diabetes by on, on average by about five to seven years. So the ADA few, several years ago said, you know, it's not going to go away. Diagnosed lifestyle modifications, metformin. The only contraindications to metformin is if somebody's got renal insufficiency. Creatinine in men greater than 1.5 and women greater than 1.4. Estimated GFR is less than 50. You know, if you have some concerns about their renal function, no, you don't use metformin. Some people won't tolerate metformin. They'll get the GI side effects. They'll get nausea, diarrhea, GI upset, gas. You may then have to, you know, discontinue it. But start low, start low dose, 500 milligram dosing and titrate as the patient can tolerate, usually up to the full dose. And, you know, with, with good intervention at an early stage of the disease, you can get prolonged remission, if you want to call it that, of the disease control. But you're not curing them. And I think that the patient needs to be told that right off the bat. We're not curing them of their disease. We're hopefully controlling it. But it is going to probably at some point progress and need more intervention. 
That's why they need the education. That's why they need monitoring blood glucoses. That's why they need follow-up hemoglobin A1Cs in laboratory. So uh, the metformin's been around in the world for over 50 years. It's the, it's the only biguanine, that's the class of drug, that's available, but it's a good one. It's been, it's been very well tolerated by most people. It's got a great track record through the years. We've had it available in the United States since 1985, so we have about 30 years of, uh, of use in the U.S., and uh, it's still main, mainstay, mainstay frontline intervention. Um, there was another baguanine that was attempted to be used uh, several years ago in the 1970s. It was quickly withdrawn from, from use because of complications, and nev there's never been any other ones that have been uh, released, but it's still, metformin is still a very good, very safe drug and should be used in all our type 2 diabetics. Now, we get into the first slide of alternative pharmaceutical agents. And some of the, your, the, the handout you have may be out of order, but all the slides are there. Um, thiazide, uh, TZDs, thiazolidine diones, say that five times. Uh, they've been around for years, probably close to 15 years now. And the first one was withdrawn from the market because of liver toxicity. And the two that we have left were rosy glitazone, and I put down the trade names because I think most people recognize trade names more better than the generic, but rosiglitazone, known as Avandia, and pioglitazone, known as Actos. I've used these drugs uh, a lot uh, over the years, but less so over the past five years. Reason being, so many concerns about side effects that patients quit use. A lot of, lot of press about side effects. And uh, with the Avandia or rosiglitazone, the, the, uh, there's a study by Nissen that rose the, the concern about cardiovascular disease and increased cardiovascular events, uh, led to the, to, the re to the almost withdrawal of the drug from the market, but instead the, the FDA decided to make it a, a restricted use drug. You had to get it from a certain pharmaceutical house. This has gone on for a few years. Very limited use of the drug because of that, because of the concerns about side effects. And then the follow-up studies suggest that there are not increased cardiovascular events. But unfortunately, because of what happened over the years, very in, infrequently used medication. Pioglitazone was therefore used in, play, in competition with rosiglitazone, and it, I think got a good chunk of the, of the uh, market share after rosiglitazone had that problem with the cardiovascular questions. Pioglitazone didn't seem to have that cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular side effects. But then they came up with bladder concerns, possible increased r incidence and risk of bladder cancer. The numbers are very small, but greater than the general population. It made a bunch of press again. So a lot of people didn't want to take Actos. Really knocked down its use. Bottom line is these are pretty good drugs, but they're not being used that much because there's so much concern by physicians and by the, lay by the patient about the possible side effects that are probably fairly minimal. But you know how that goes. Uh, these are great insulin sensitizers. When uh, they came out several years ago, they were a huge new op option for us to use because they, in, they in re significantly improved insulin sen sensitivity and improved blood glucose values and were frequently and, and still are used in combination with other medications and are very effective. They do have the other side effect that is not well received of sometimes significant weight gain, especially if used with insulin and fluid retention, sometimes significant fluid retention, so not a good drug to use in pe people that have uh, congestive heart failure or even are at risk for congestive heart failure because of, of uh, my cardi uh, cardiac disease or, or myopathies. Um, so I, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a historical drug. We don't see these medications used near as much because of mainly side effects, but uh, they were a great addition to our armament of treatment when they came out. Because all we had at, before the TZDs was pretty much the sulfonylureas, metformin, and insulin. So these were great to use. They did, they did work very well, but they had these, the adverse side effects that we really, that I felt were the worst ones were the significant weight gain and fluid retention. 
So I don't know if you have many patients, if anybody here has many patients on this, but we have a small number in our practice now that are still taking it, doing the ones that we keep on it are doing well without side effects, and, and uh, so we keep them on it. Since then, there's been a, a release of uh, very, uh, of several other classes of medications, and so this is one of the ones that came out several years ago. Uh, I'm thinking it's close to 10 years ago. It's the dipeptidyl peptase inhibitors, and better known as the DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, there's now four in this class, and the, the initial one that was released several years ago was citagliptin, better known to you all as Genuvia. And th since then, there's been saxagliptin, which is Anglisa, linagliptin, Trigenta, elagliptin, Nicinia. And I don't know if you've heard of many of these other ones, but they're available. And uh, I think you'll see them more. I think that as we get more competition, I hope we'll see some better use of these other agents. These are, um, they work at the level of the gut. And uh, to try to summarize it real quickly, the, the, the mechanism of action is to block the, the DPP-4 enzyme. That enzyme degrades GLP, glucagonal-like peptide, which is a hormone that's from in the gut, the small intestine, that is stimulated by food. Food stimulates the release of GLP, which is diminished in type 2 diabetics. So if we can block the degradation with the inhibitor, you get higher GLP levels that then stimulate insulin release from the pancreas and decrease glucagon release. So they help lower mainly postprandial blood glucoses. Got that? All right. So nice pills to use in combination with like metformin or insulin. You know, you got a basal insulin, so you got the background insulin, and then you got the meal time coverage with these drugs. Not really that potent. So it's not something that you want to use when someone's way out of control. This is a early on intervention. This is something where the A1C is 7.2% on metformin. Nice drug to add because it doesn't cause hypoglycemia. Benefit does not cause hypoglycemia. It only works when you eat. It only does the job when you eat. The food stimulates its action. Weight neutral, kind of nice too. Can use in chronic kidney disease, kind of nice. So it's got a lot of nice uh, benefits to it. And like always, there's always potential side effect. And the big concerns in this drug class is pancreatic issues. There's been concerns about pancreatitis and even maybe a small concern about pancreatic CA. But cause and effect has not really been totally assessed and, uh, and proven. You know, we have greater incidence of, of pancreatitis in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. And there's truly, if it is any effect of increasing pancreatitis, it's very, very small. And personally, I've not seen it to be a, a problem clinically. But, you know, you got to tell the patient that there is that risk. And if you get GI side, side effects, you should let us know. The other thing in rat studies with huge doses of these drugs, they, they were able to stimulate medullary thyroid cancer. But I, I, again, not felt to be a real concern in, in, in humans, but it is in the black box. So if people read the black box, you're going to have to be aware of that side effect. So you can talk to them and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't think it's that big of an issue and we'll keep an eye on that. But never have seen that. We don't see very much medullary thyroid cancer in general, period. And we have a very busy uh, thyroid clinic. It's a very rare form of thyroid cancer. So I think it's a great uh, class of medications. It gives us a nice alternative for an add-on early on in someone that's failing metformin, an add-on as a third drug sometimes if someone's failing metformin, maybe a sulfonylurea. Uh, so it's, remember this class. It's uh, like everything else, and I'm not really going to get into it. But I'll say it just now. Most of these newer agents are still not generic, so you're going to have the concerns about cost. Big area, big area of, of, of use in my practice is, is the actual GLP-1 agonists. These are the glucagon-like peptides, receptor agonists. These, these are the drugs that uh, I think have uh, given us opportunity to not only treat diabetes, but also treat weight. And, and hopefully help people reduce weight. First one that came out several years ago was exenatide.
better known to you as Bieda. Bieda is very rarely used in my practice now. It's a BID dose medication. You've got to be taken right before the meals. It's very difficult for people to take. But when it came out, people were willing to do it because not only did it improve their blood glucose control, but it helped them reduce weight. And they were willing to do anything if that was going to happen. So we were given twice a day injections uh, with this drug for several years. Since then, there's been the explosion of competitors. Uh, Exenatide, the company makes that, made a long-acting agent called Bidurian, which is once a week, once a week that they have to inject. Lurigliritide, Victoza, is once a day. And you have the other two that have come out very recently. Um, listed there, am ambiglutide and dilutide, uh, better known as tansium and trulicity that are once a week also. So hopefully as we get these players in, uh, approved on, on formulas, they'll be better available. Because again, the biggest concern and the biggest problem we have right now with these agents is getting approval from their insurance carriers. They, they work in, in that area also of the, the gut, the small bowel production of GLP. This is basically, it, it gives you a GLP-1 agonist injected. It, it, uh, when food is consumed, it stimulates the action of these drugs. It, releases, it causes release of insulin from the pancreas, reduction of glucagon, and uh, reduction of appetite and satiety, it's a feeling of satiety. And as a result, they can have decreased post-meal blood glucoses and decreased weight. Nice combination pill with metformin again, sometimes with other agents. Uh, so it's, it's a nice, been a nice addition to our armament of, of intervention for type 2 diabetes. Doesn't cause low blood glucose by itself. If you have this as a monotherapy or with metformin, it will not cause low blood glucose. Question comes up sometimes, do you ever use the GLP-1 agonist with the DPP-4 inhibitors? They do work a little differently, but there are no studies that have looked at that combination, so we, in general, do not use both those agents together. We use one or the other. Uh, they both are working in the same area of, of uh, physiology. The concerns are just like the, uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors, that's the pancreas issues. And you don't want to use this in people that have gastroparesis, because it does also delay gastric emptying. So if you have someone that, you know, diabetic that already has some problems with gastroparesis, you will precipitate or worsen that with this class of drugs. So, you know, don't do that. Uh, we also don't use it in people with significant renal insufficiency, estimated GFR less than 30. Or those, just like with the DPP-4 inhibitors, if they have a per personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer or MEN2, which is multiple endocrine type 2. Again, very rare diseases, nothing to really worry about, but if, if you want to be sure that you've talked to the patient about the possible side effects when you start these medications. But in general, other than the GI side effect of nausea, uh, these, which does pass quickly in most people, these are very well tolerated and effective. Newest uh, player on the block is SGLT2, sodium glucose co-transport inhibitors. Um, I think Dr. Elmakayad spoke on this being available soon in one of his talks a couple years ago. It's available. They've been available now for a couple years. Uh, the first one that came out was canicoflosin, or better known as Invulcana. Since then, Daptoclosin, uh, Farsica, and Epicoflosin, Jardiance, have come out. Okay, so now we have three players in this class of medication. They promote reabsorption of filtered glucose and resultant renal excretion of glucose. So they do have a diuretic effect. They do cause increased urine output. And they can cause UTIs and vaginitis, especially the vaginitis in women especially. And there's been a few reports of DKA, and that was a surprise. But there have been a few reports of DKA in patients on this class of drug. Um, they lower the glucose independent of insulin effect. They're, di they're directly at that renal absorption uh, level where they work. They can, because of their diuretic effect, uh, cause some decreased blood in the blood pressure and the weight, a modest weight reduction. So 
I don't know if you've used these medications, but Dr. Elmakai and I are using them quite a bit. And uh, they're nice add-ons. I've not used them as monotherapy. I've added, on, I've added them on to a variety of other oral agents. They have been approved by the FDA to be added on to almost any other drug that we have for type 2 diabetes. I'm going to get into some of the other ones that I don't use very much, but I want you to know that they're out there. Sometimes I get twisted and turned and forced to try to use things because I have truck drivers that don't want to take insulin, and they're going to do everything in their, their anything possible, anything that can be done to avoid insulin because they want to drive their trucks. Or you have people that just refuse, refuse to take injectable medications no matter how hard you try and explain and try to get them to, to, to agree. Most of the time, at some point, we're successful, but over, it may take years. So these are other alternatives that are not used that much. This has been around for a long time, this class of drug. Um, the, the one that's the oldest on the market is Acrobos, also known as Precos. Um, the, uh, the competitor is Miclitol. Fentanyl, and that's glycet. Um, they slow absorption of glucose by the gut, and they help decrease the post-meal blood glucoses. They do have a lot of GI side effects. They can cause flatulence, diarrhea, and they're difficult to take because they have to. They are very short acting, so it has to be a TID dose medication. Um, in general, not very well tolerated because of GI side effects. Not used that much, but it is an alternative. Another alternative is the mobitinides. The two that are on market are rapliglitinide, which is known as Prandin, and miglitinide, known as Starlex. I very rarely use these medications. I used to use them a long time ago, but for the past several years, very infrequent use. Again, only in special cases where the individuals have tried a variety of other medications. They just don't want to take injectable medications, so we're we were forced, if you want to call it, to go to, to some of the less used alternatives. And then that they work by regulating the ATP-dependent potassium channels in the beta cells. They work in the, at the beta cells and increase insulin secretion. Short-acting, pretty safe in u to use in chronic kidney disease. They can cause hypoglycemia because they stimulate insulin. And again, it's a TID dose medication. Sulfonylurea is less and less used by endocrinology forced to be used sometimes by insurance. Um, the ones that we have available that are still being used on the market are glimipiride, better known as amaryl, glipizide, which is glucotrol, and gliburide, micronase or diabinase. And if, uh, what they do is similar to the maglitinides, they, they inhibit the ATP-dependent potassium channels in base cell and stimulate insulin secretion, longer duration of, of, of action. And that is a concern, especially in the elderly. If you have elderly patients on glyburide, I don't know if the physicians here have seen, but you're getting things from the, from the uh, Medicare uh, saying that they don't want you to have this person on glyburide. The reason being is in these elderly patients with renal insufficiency, you can get prolonged, severe, life-threatening hypoglycemia, especially from glyburide. So don't recommend that use in the elderly. If you're going to use a sulfonylurea, use one of the other two that's listed there. We're not big advocate. I don't know about Dr. Amakai, but I'm not a big advocate of using the sulfonylureas that much anymore because we have so many other better options. And but again, you know, I see a lot of people come in on sulfonylureas and metformin. Probably once every two months, they come in because they're having problems with hypoglycemia. And why is that happening? Because you've had an aggressive doctor, like we tell you to be. They put them on metformin. They want to add a second drug. Everything's denied, except for sulfonylurea. They get on sulfonylurea and they get hypoglycemic. And then they come to me or Dr. Ramakad and say, why am I hypoglycemic? Well, it's because you're on glyburide. You know, so you can use them later in the disease, which is kind of not great because you know you already you want to get better control and probably need insulin by that stage. But in the earlier onset, I mean, the earlier interventions that we like you to do, it's metformin and some of these other drugs that are not going to cause hypoglycemia. And they're going to be effective and maybe help them lose weight. It's all cost benefit. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. I don't know if you know this, but uh, one of the bile acid sequestrants, Wellcol, has been available now for several years. 
FDA approved for use in type 2 diabetes mellitus. It lowers blood sugar. They're not really sure how they do it. It's suspected it's probably because of reduced GI absorption, of reabsorption of glucose. GI side effects, as you all know from these drugs, would be constipation and dyspepsia and nausea. So now I have only used it a few times, and again, in those special cases, but it is a drug that's approved by the FDA. Mm -hmm. Another one, I don't know if you knew this, it came out probably about five, four or five years ago, a quick-release bromocryptine agent called Cycloset. Anybody heard of that? Anybody heard of Cycloset? Big user here, huh? Um, it is approved by the FDA for use in type 2 diabetes mellitus. They don't know how it works, but it did lower the A1C. <laughs> I don't know how they came up with the study to do it. But anyway, it's been approved. It's uh, kind of pricey because it's another use of an old drug. You know how that goes. Uh, side effects are just like bromocryptine. Pretty well tolerated. I usually let Dr. Spencer order that. Yeah. A drug that's not used very much by me, I don't know about Dr. A, but uh, I'd like to use it more, but it's the same problem that you always have. It's getting people to, to buy into injections. It's a synthetic analog of amylin, which is pramlatine, better known as simlin. I have a few people on it. It's, again, it's difficult to get them to use. I usually use it more in my type 1s that are, that are uh, having some problems with post-meal blood glucose and are overweight. It's a good alternative there. You can use it in type 2s, but the only FDA approval is the, for people on insulin. So you see the dilemma. you got a type 2 diabetic that's already on two to four shots of insulin, and then you add in Simlin, and it's another three shots because it's a short-acting mealtime uh, medication. It slows gastric emptying, reduces post-meal blood glucoses, suppresses the abnormal rise of glucagon, in patients with diabetes mellitus. So that's where it works. It works at suppressing glucagon. So it works in a different way to lower the post-meal blood glucoses, and it allows you to reduce sometimes the mealtime insulin dosing that people need, especially with type 1, well, type 1s or type 2s. It helps reduce the amount of insulin that they need. They are only approved in insulin-treated patients. Side effect is mainly nausea. It does slow somewhat the gastric emptying. Don't want to use it in people with gastroparesis, and it can cause hypoglycemia. But in general, very safe medication. It's just the fact that it's got to be taken three times a day. Uh, right now, it's available in pens. And the hope is at some point, although I don't know when it's going to happen, that they'll allow it to be piggybacked into pumps, which would be nice because then you can get your pump patient to use Simlin along with their insulin. And then it, it, you wouldn't have to do more injections. But right now, we don't have that available. So it's a lot, of, a lot more injections and a lot more resistance by patients to taking that many shots. And cost is also, you know, also. Someone asked earlier if we we're going to talk about insulin. I don't have a lot of time, but here's the different insulins that are available. We have rapid acting insulins that listed there, lisp aspartic glucosine, uh, basal insulins, glargine. Uh, the newest one on the block is a long is a U three hundred glargine called Tujeo. And again, this is very new. It's a U three hundred. And uh, again, we can talk more about that, if, uh, questions if you have that, but uh, it's Lanthus insulin, but it's a U300 instead of U100. Uh, Detamir, better known as Levamir, is the, another basal insulin that's available. And there's newer insulins being developed right now that I think should be available in the next couple of years. They're even more rapid acting and some other ba newer uh, competitor basal insulins coming down the pipeline. We do have a new, just the past few months, inhaled insulin called Afriza comes uh, in four and eight unit cartridges. They, it's simple to use compared to the old Exubra. Do you remember that one? Uh, that was a very, that was like a bong. And <laughs> it was about this big. They expected people to carry around. It didn't go over very well. Pfizer had to take it off the market, I think, because there's questionable use for, for the drug. Yeah. But in this case, this looks like an inhaler. It works. Very nicely, it's discreet. People like the, that. There's, uh, you can use it. It's a mealtime insulin. You can use it in type one or type two. It's uh, nice for people that don't like to take shots. It's nice for people for, that want to be discreet and think that they're showing people they're just using their inhaler. Um, you have to have baseline pulmonary function tests. You can't be a smoker. You shouldn't have you know significant uh, lung disease. There's all these things that because it's a new drug, you're going to have to follow the guidelines. But we're just starting to use it. And uh, we're, we're coming up with that same resistance from the drug companies. Afriza, what's that? 
You know, it it's just amazes me. Oh, it's not on our formula. We don't cover that. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you have to kind of work with them, and hopefully we'll be able to use this because I think it's a nice new addition to the management of insulin-treated patients. There's premixed insulins. There's old, you know, that's the 70-30s, uh, both the Humalog, Novalog. There's the, uh, the old standby 70-30s, 70-25s, 50-50s. You know, these are mainly for type 2 patients that are older and they're just trying to keep, their, they need insulin and you're trying to keep them out of trouble, the premixed insulins. Um, U500, that's, that's where we work. That's our group. <laughs> so those are the people that are very insulin resistant and we have U500 regular insulin that we use sometimes in pumps and sometimes just as like TID injections. Huge amounts of insulin. Those are people that are, you know, needing 500 units a day of insulin. It's just a more concentrated insulin. It allows them to, to better administer that, uh, that. First line of treatment, metformin, unless contraindicated because of side effects or renal failure. Second line, several options. The, 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 the standard approach, if you look at the uh, ADA guidelines, is sulfonylurea. Uh, yeah, if it's, it's hard to use sometimes in people that you're trying to get aggressively managed early on. If they're, if they're A1C 7.1 and you add on a soft line, you're probably going to have problems with hypoglycemia. So the other add-ons could be DPP-4 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, TZDs, insulin. They all work. You've got to choose the one that you think is best for your patient. Obese, insulin resistant, maybe the GLP-1 agonist. Uh, not that obese, doesn't want to take a shot, maybe the DPP-4 inhibitor. The A1C is already up to greater than 7.5%. Maybe add the sulfonylurea. Already up to 8%, maybe add the insulin. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard decision sometimes. Uh, go with combinations, like I just said there, maybe a DPP-4 inhibitor or GLP-1 agonist with a basal insulin. Combination oral agents, you can use the uh, uh, DPP-4 inhibitor, metformin, SGLT2 inhibitor, you know. Oral agents with insulin, I like that one a lot. Get a basal insulin with uh, drugs that uh, help lower the post-meal blood sugars. Um, combination insulin therapy, MDI programs, three, sh three, ba three, rapid three shots of rapidathrin insulin analog with a basal insulin and some pumps. We do a lot of insulin pumps in our type 1s. We're not talking about type 1 now, but even in some of our type 2s that we are struggling with, we're doing more and more in, uh, insulin pump therapy in those individuals. And I don't have time to talk about it in another lecture, bariatric surgery. You know, you can talk forever about that one. Um, you know, in some cases of the morbidly obese, and many cases of the morbidly obese, they do benefit immensely from that procedure. But as I said at the beginning of the talk, sometimes it comes to your choice. So I open it up for questions. We have about five, ten minutes. Yes? Oh, good question. Okay. Is metformin safe during pregnancy? If you're not in the United States, it's used a lot in, uh, in uh, uh, overseas. Uh, that's where most of the studies have been done. It's the safety seems to be good. It actually has, is it category B? No, metformin. B? Is it category B? Yeah. They've approved, uh, I mean, it's used with caution in the U.S. Not our frontline drug. Um, we, if you see, we see a lot of patients that have uh, PCOS and problems with <coughs> infertility that are treated with metformin for that entity. It helps them conceive, and usually what we do is we leave them on metformin for the first 10 to 12 weeks because there have been some studies that suggest that if it's withdrawn in the fr earlier than that, there may be actually be a higher incidence of miscarriage, and then we convert them to insulin. At least that's my approach. Yeah. So we, in the U.S., are not using it through the whole pregnancy, but there are definitely women that have done that in the United States and throughout the world and done very well. Rick, uh, how often do you run into insurance company barriers and also the Medicaid population? Are you limited with the drugs you use for the Medicaid population, either the insulin or the oral yeah. drugs? You, we're, we're, we run into that problem every minute of the day. The lady in front of you 
I'm surprised she still has hair. Um, <laughs> so, but diligence and persistence, and she does a great job of often getting things done. Thank you, Terry. Uh, your question about Medicaid, you know, Medicaid's actually, they, they require a lot of prior approval, but they've come a long way. They're, they're coming around. They, they've actually started approving, um, this is not for these medici medicines, but they're getting better approval for pumps and sensors. Now, I haven't talked about that because that's more type 1 diabetic care, but j j continuous glucose monitors. They, they seem to be ahead of Medicare with, uh, with uh, becoming more uh, in the line of improving those medications. Now, the, the, uh, the, the newer agents, they have to go through their formula committee, and you, you usually wait a few years before it gets approved. But I think what's on Medicaid now, is it by Durian? By Ada? Still by Ada. So see, it's taken them a while, but yeah. We gotta, we gotta use what they'll approve, but they're better than you think. Thanks, Rick. Couple of questions. Uh, should we be using metformin in pre-diabetes? Good question. Yes. <laughs> Off-label. Mm -hmm. But since you asked, I think it's a very good idea. Because like I told you, if you in the assisted reproductive area, they use metformin in uh, pa patients with insulin resistance and PCOS all the time. So that's another area that's used that are non-diabetic. Uh, I, I think that the data is pretty strong that you, you're doing benefit with metformin in the pre-diabetic or the, the impaired glucose tolerant patient. So in general, the answer to that is yes. Okay. But it's not, it, it's not on label for that drug. Okay. Uh, and then uh, when I tell a patient they have pre-diabetes finally, some of them get fired up and do something about their o obesity. And what if we were to order insulin levels and catch them three years earlier and told them they had pre-diabetes? Is anybody doing that? No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's pretty price. The price of doing those tests probably outweighs the benefits. I think you can do it by, remember those risk factors we went through and, and just diligence with checking their blood glucoses and occasional A1Cs. Yeah, Rick, I always, <coughs> I always assumed there was a uh, direct uh, straight line relationship between obesity and the development of, of diabetes. But you said something that kind of contradicted that a little bit. Well, not really. I said that you don't have every 400-pound patient come in that's diabetic because there are other things that have to be present for diabetes to develop. They have to be insulin resistant. They're going to be insulin resistant. They're going to be insulin resistant at that weight. But they may have very healthy beta cells and go on for years without developing type 2 diabetes. The patients we see, they come in, in at a younger age, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, I consider that younger now. Uh, they... Uh, they tend to be not only obese, but if you did the studies, which we don't, they have beta cell dysfunction. So that's what really brings it out, is that they have to have that beta cell dysfunction because if their beta cells are healthy, they can just pump out insulin and keep their sugars normal. I won't say any names, but I saw a patient just before I came over here, 23 years old, since childhood, since probably six years old, she has one of the worst cases of acanthosis nigricans that I've seen. Her blood sugars are perfect. I bet you her insulin level is five times normal. So her, her beta cells are really healthy. No family history of type 2 diabetes. I don't know. She may go until she's 75 years old before she becomes a diabetic, but she's already got a BMI of 45. You know, so you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting group that we're dealing with. So uh, she'd be a good candidate for bariatric surgery probably at some point. But uh, just met her today, so I can't do that. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Rick, do you, do you find the extended release metformin better tolerated in regards to GI side effects than the regular metformin? Yeah, that's what it's, it's, it's touted to be that way, and I do that. We do that a lot. We, we convert people from immediate release to extended release if they're having GI side effects, and some get better and some don't. But I think it's a nice alternative to try instead of just stopping it because they had some gas or diarrhea. And make sure you tell the patient when you start metformin that you can expect some GI side effects, expect some nausea, expect some loose stools. They're usually not bad. It usually goes away within a few weeks. And, you know, give it some time. I mean, if it's if it continues, persists, or worsens, then yeah, maybe you're not going to be a candidate. But I'd say probably 95% of people can tolerate metformin in one of those two forms. 
I right. tend to go with the extended release a lot because it's once a day instead of twice a day. All right. Rick, a question about the pre-diabetic patients or the borderline diabetic patients in neurology. We often see people with a polyneuropathy, and then when we do the investigation, they have borderline or pre-diabetic condition. What's the uh, literature suggesting on treatment for those people who are not having a really high blood sugar, but they're clearly having an axonal type of polyneuropathy that's typical of diabetes, and they're pre-diabetic or borderline diabetic. What, what's the well, I think it comes back to what Gary asked. I think a lot of times we'll put those people on metformin. Yeah. But I, yeah. it's not going to help their polyneuropathy, unfortunately. Yeah. And we all have those cases where we pa patients come in with the complications of the disease, and they don't really seem to have much of a disease. You know, the polyneuropathy, retinopathy, uh, even the proteinuria, and it's like, wow, you know, it's such a, it's such a weird um, presentation sometimes. You know, sometimes people will have very limited hyperglycemia, and yet they'll have complications, and other patients will have ex terrible hyperglycemia for extended periods of time and not have any complications. It's just, it's hard to predict. But yeah, I, I, I don't know what else other than probably metformin in that, age, in that uh, pa patient population you're talking about. And Rick, I'd just like to give you and your office a little warning. You know, Medicaid is going to be taken over by private managed care companies. And so we are going to be cho choosing which of two or three or four companies may cover our patients. And we'd like your advice as to which managed care companies to stay away from and maybe which ones we might utilize. Because if you say that Medicaid is actually doing a pretty good job, that's going to change as soon as these private yeah. managed care companies, their goal is to reduce costs, and <laughs> not for the long run, the short run. The, you know, Medicaid may have gotten smarter because they know that these people 20, 30 years later are going to have a lot of complications. Yeah. But yeah. these managed care companies are not in it for the long run. Right. Well, I think you'd be seeing more people on and that uh, they'll probably want us to use um, metformin, sulfonylureas, and biata. You know, that's probably, they'll probably have a pretty limited with all those other things that I told you about, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the DPP4 inhibitors. They'll be very selective, and it'll have to, it'll have to be prior approved. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge, but I think it's kind of an exciting er time for type 2 diabetics because we have so many options that we never used to have. And I, I think that we need to be aware of those and try to use them. And, you know, it, it's, you got to take e each individual. I mean, I know that that's just a, we always say that, but each individual is that is, uh, is a special case, and we need to kind of treat each one differently, and there's just a lot of options. Type 1 is actually easier because we know that they need insulin. It's just a matter of how we're going to get it to them. Type 2 has become a challenge. A challenge and a and a and it's kind of sometimes it's even kind of uh, fun because it's always like well uh, don't don't worry we got something else for you now. <laughs> Any other questions? I got a quick question for you. Um, I realize you're not uh, you're a tremendous amount of time, but could you just touch on just for a second on on the advantages of these new long actings versus the old NPHs and and along that note, I'm curious why you feel the NPHs stay on the market. Why is just, it on the market? Just still? the peaks and the inconsistencies of duration. You were asking why MPH is still on the market? Yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, when I, when I trained, we had NPH, ultra lente, lente, and regular. And we no longer have ultra lente or lente. They haven't gotten rid of NPH yet, I don't know. Um, NPH for a while, I think was kept on the market and still around because the basal insulins that came out, Lantus, and th this is probably, this is my opinion, <laughs> the basal insulins that came out, uh, the Lantus and the Levomir, uh, were not approved or not used much in pregnancy, and there was a concern about using them in pregnancy. And NPH had been used for years, so until only maybe a year ago, is that about it? Maybe two years ago, Levomir actually got approval for uh, uh, safety in, in pregnancy. So that's become my basal insulin in pregnancy. But until then, we used MPH. I used MPH in, in my pregnant GDMs or pregnant diabetics that were 
you know, type twos that needed to be put on insulin. So that's where I still used NPH. Now that Lovemir is available, I don't use NPH, except for the rare patient that's on a 70-30 mix or something like that that's real elderly and doesn't want to take more than two shots. So the basal insulins are better. There's less hypoglycemia, and there's better 24-hour coverage, and you don't have the peaks and the troughs that you have with the NPH. If you thought that was bad, you should have tried to use an ultra lente back in the old days. Man, that drug was something. But, uh, yeah, that's all history. That's, that's like, I, I can't believe I lived through it. It's been so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I agree. I, I, we don't use MPH very much anymore. And, and um, there are a lot of peaks, a lot of hypoglycemia with it. And that's the biggest concern. Um, when they looked at, there was a treat the target study, which you compared glargine, which is Viantis, to MPH. You could achieve pretty much the same control of the blood glucoses, but there was much, much less hypoglycemia with the glargine compared to the MPH. Any other? Well, thank you. It's been fun.